people. It's Ashley, the best half of the Summers Twins. You just jumped right on my intro. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's Aspen, the better half of the Summers Twins. Why do you have to be the first one to talk? Because if you say best half first, then what am I supposed to say? Well, I don't know. You got to be creative. But I don't have to be creative every time. Well, then you get to start every time. And then people are going to be like, ew, who's that girl with that annoying voice? I'm going to turn this off. Yeah, you're right. Well, anyway. You're Wait, listening. now I didn't get to introduce myself. You already did. Oh, but I thought you were. I'm just going to not talk for this whole episode. Okay. Too bad we already recorded the interview. So this was one of the rare times where Ashley wasn't sick. So she actually did talk. <gasps> I'm just kidding. It's only been like two that know, I've been I'm just kidding. For. Well, everyone, you're listening to Twinspiration on It's a Twin Thing. Oh, <laughs> what was that about? I was trying to yawn. I was trying to make a yawning noise. <laughs> I don't know how. Like, because you're bored of yeah. me talking? Oh, people are going to turn this off because they're confused what you're doing. I don't know how to make a yawning noise, apparently. Oh, what? my gosh. Somebody has a dog in the dorm. I've never seen a dog in... A campus building before. Okay, anyway. (laughs) I can't do it. Now it's kind of going to drive me crazy until I figure out how. Before we get to our guest today, it is time for our inspirational in it. If you're new, which hopefully you just know the story by now because our old listeners are tired of it. This is our good news minute story, except Ashley calls it the inspirational in it. So today's good news story is about a husband and wife in Austin, Texas, who own a restaurant called Nixta Taqueria, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong. I'm sorry. In 2019, they started something as part of their restaurant where they put a community fridge outside of their restaurant and they would stock to-go meals and leftovers and anything that they could afford as well as fresh produce and groceries. And this was for people who couldn't afford healthy foods. Austin is considered a food desert. Um, And so they started this free fridge program and they would replenish it as many as 20 times a day. And it became just a really important source of life and nourishment for the community. Then last summer, the restaurant ran into some financial problems. They were forced to shut down because of an electrical issue which they said was caused by an oversight by the city. But because of this, they thought that they might have to close for good because they just couldn't afford to keep operations going. And then because of the community support that they had gathered due to this free fridge, the community created a GoFundMe for them and they raised over $80,000 to help them keep their operations going until they were able to fix the issue and go back to normal operations. I love this story because... I think it's amazing, first of all, that they started the community fridge program and they weren't expecting anything in return. They were just doing it to benefit and support the people in their community who needed it. But then because of that, when they needed something, the community turned around and supported them. And I just, I think it's important to do things out of the goodness of your heart, but then karma also is going to come back and give you what you put out. And I think things can go wrong at the snap of a finger. And if you're always wanting (laughs) <laughs> snap into the really strong microphones why don't you i was just demonstrating thank you i told you we had to do this fast because it was a long episode it's only been like three minutes anyway it's just nice that people will turn around and scratch each other's backs and ashley's laughing because she doesn't like that phrase okay i'm just gonna shut up now i'm sorry you can decipher for yourselves why that was a good story it was a good story That's a good story, Grandpa. Okay, Ashley, go ahead and introduce our guest. I had to ask you a question, though, based on what you said about the story. Okay. (laughs) What if you don't have any goodness in your heart? What do you mean? You said people should do things out of the goodness in their heart. But I was just wondering, what if there's none there? I guess they should call you because you can relate. I'm I'm just kidding! I'm, I'm just kidding. trying to be I'm just trying to make our podcast interesting so people will listen, but I guess you just don't like humor or fun <laughs> or happiness. Right. I don't. But good thing our guest likes fun. She just really wants me to get to the introduction <laughs> because I have to edit the whole episode oh, and this. Poor Aspen. 
Everybody leave a teardrop in the comments for Aspen. <laughs> but I will introduce our guest now because we are very excited about him and we think our listeners, aka our dad, <laughs> will be very excited about this episode too. So on this week's episode, we got to interview Will Padilla, who is the host of the podcast 1980s Now, which we will link to in the show notes. And he is a lover of the 1980s. That's when he grew up. And he has this podcast where he talks about all things 1980s and interviews iconic people from the 1980s. In this episode, we got to talk to him a little bit about his journey and how he started his podcast, and we also got a little bit into 80s pop culture. But don't worry, even if you weren't alive in the 80s, there is still a lot of interesting stuff that you will learn about from this episode because we also were not alive in the 80s, but we really enjoyed it. So we hope that you will listen and enjoy and check out his podcast. So without further ado, here is Will Padilla. You need to stop saying without further ado. Okay. So here we go. (laughs) That was better. What's a quote from the 1980s? Godspeed. Is that from the 1980s? Um, totally tubular, dude. I don't think that is. (laughs) Yes, it is. Okay, without further blabbering, here we go. (laughs) How is your day going so far? It's good, except it's freezing here in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, are you in Cleveland? Yeah. It was literally oh, three degrees out today. Oh, oh my gosh. gosh. And it felt like negative 10, according to the weather. That sounds miserable. We're from Colorado, and that's where our parents are right now, and it's like in the negatives yesterday and today, yeah. so we're enjoying the 65-degree weather in ah. Los Angeles. <laughs> I've got friends out there who complain when it's in the 60s, like, I have to wear a sweater today. That's like spring to us in Cleveland. I mean, I will say I grew up in Colorado, so I miss like the cold, snowy weather. I don't like not having seasons in LA, so I do complain about it. But then when I hear people talking about it being that cold in other parts of the country, I'm not sad that I'm not there. (laughs) Well, yeah. All right. So at least you can, you you know, you guys can appreciate it and know how good you have it there in LA. (laughs) Yeah. But we have a lot of family in Cleveland, and I know people knock it a lot, but we love Cleveland, so Mm -hmm. we're fans. Yeah, I'm not from here originally, but I got to tell you, and I'm from New Jersey originally, right right across the river from New York, and I'm very very kind of snobbish in that regard when I moved here. I was like, oh, it's never going to be as good as where I live. It's great here. You're right. I love it here. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. I've been here for a long time now, but yeah. Can you pardon me for one moment? I have a cat who's trying to get in my studio. Oh. (laughs) The cat wants to be a podcaster. Aww. (laughs) Our dog wants nothing to do with us when we're recording. He's back in Colorado, but he likes to be on camera. But when we're just sitting and recording, Ashley always wants to have him on her lap. He does not like to sit still, so he wants to get out of there. Yeah. Um, Well, thank you so much for doing this, especially so last minute. We're super excited to get to talk to you. I guess to get started, I'm super curious if you have always been interested in the 80s or how that interest kind of developed. Obviously, we weren't alive in the 80s, but we have a dad Mm -hmm. who grew up in the 80s and is just like obsessed with it and always has been. So I'm curious if that was your experience or if you kind of got interested in it later in life. Well, I grew up um, just to be really direct. uh, I was born in the 1970s, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So the 80s to me has always been uh, a decade of fascination for me. First and foremost, because that's the era that I became an adult. You know, I was 10 when the 80s started and I was 18 by the time it ended. That doesn't add up to 10 years, though. How's that? Well, something like that. So, yeah. So for me, first, it was uh, having grown up in it. I thought it was special. But probably when you guys grew up during that, you know, not that long ago for you guys. But when you grew up in those formative years, I would imagine you feel a special fondness for the era in which you grew up. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just lucky enough that I think enough as it you know as i got older and looking back so first looking back it was a matter of nostalgia because you know again i was a kid and you know you know became a teenager had first crushes first loves you know a lot of firsts throughout the decade but then so looking back i was fond of it for that but it became more objective to me that and again i, I don't think this is too biased but during that period of time and i think your dad would back me up it was an era in which we had more new kinds of music developed technology movies, types of movies, more more art, technology, some things not so great, but we're born out of the 1980s that still continue today. And so for me, 
I really do think the 1980s could probably rival the medieval renaissance. And I'm not a historic history buff, so I'd have to do a little more research. But I do think it's that important and magical in the era, you know, aside from the fact that I grew up then. So, yeah, I've always been fascinated with it in one way or another, uh, although I guess my perspectives changed as I got older. So then how did your interest or fascination with it turn into you starting this podcast? Because I read on your yeah. bio that you had worked as like a composer and a writer and an actor, and then you kind of transitioned into podcasting. So can you tell us how that transition happened and what inspired you to start a podcast? Sure. Yeah, uh, you're right. Uh, all those things are true. I, I did those things when I was younger, in my 20s mostly. And then as I got older, I tried to be more practical, which if you're inter inter interested in anything, look, I'm not going to give you, you, your parents will maybe contradict this. And that's good. You should listen to them. But I made a mistake, I think, in the sense that I was interested in, in artistic things when I was young. And you're right, I did. I worked in theater in New York for a period of time. Then I thought, I got to be practical, right? I got to mm -hmm. grow up. You know, my parents were encouraging me to grow up. Uh, and so that for me became getting a more conventional nine to five job. But as it turns out, if you're a creative person, and I suspect you guys are creative somewhat because you have a podcast, that you can't suppress those urges, those instincts to want to make stuff. And so uh, as I was getting older and I was in my 40s, I was looking for opportunities to start doing things again. And I didn't live in New York anymore where theater, you know, you could find anybody who will want to start a theater company with you by just opening mm -hmm. your door. Uh, but living where I, I do now in Cleveland, it was a little more difficult. And as I looked, I tried different things at first. But then uh, just a few years ago, about five or six years ago, I had uh, uh, I was working on my house and <laughs> stupidly, here's some more advice for you. If you're working with power tools, wear ear protection. Mm. Uh, but stupidly, I caused some hearing damage to, to my ears. Unlike other experience injuries I've had, hearing injuries are terrifying because you can't turn off your ears. I was hearing things distorted, like everybody sounded like a robot and things were sounding like two pitches in different ears. And uh, I had a con constant loud ringing and humming and it was terrible. And doctors say, you know, well, we don't know what will happen. It may get better. Well, who knows? We really can't tell because ears, it turns out, are if you once you damage them, there's nothing you can do to fix them. So since I had this constant ringing in my ears that I couldn't escape, I looked for ways to just listen to things that would keep me entertained and podcasts became the thing. And because of my love of the 1980s that you pointed out, I thought, hey, I'll find one that talks about the 1980s in, in, in the, from the perspective that I mentioned to you earlier. And I couldn't find any. Uh, I think at the time, folks my age, you know, five, six years ago, didn't know how to make podcasts. So older folks weren't making content that I would like, you know. So I started one. And because I had the experience working in theater, doing sound design and composing, as you mentioned, and having experience working with audio equipment and that sort of thing, that part was easy. I wasn't intimidated by that part. It was just, you know, coming, to, coming up with the content, which, again, because I love the 1980s, wasn't too hard either. So what would you say were some of the biggest challenges? Because, I mean, we from our experience, there's certain things about podcasting that we love, but then it's definitely hard to like get an audience and promote your podcast, especially like we are both very artistic people. We're studying theater, so we're not super qualified, I guess, with like the tech side and the marketing side and things like that. Right. So for you, were those kind of challenges or what would you say were some of the most unexpected challenges and how did you overcome those? That's a fantastic question. And it's sort of the thing that all podcasters are trying to figure out. I got to say, first of all, though, you know, in our interactions that we had leading up to recording this interview today, I am so impressed with you guys already. <laughs> Thanks. How together you've got yourself, how professional in your communication, in your setup here. You already seem to be way further ahead than most people that decide, hey, let's start a podcast. So congratulations in that regard. Thank you. I guess the biggest challenge I think is the one you hit on is and the one that you sort of get sucked into or caught up in your head is that idea that. I'm not getting enough listeners or I'm not getting them fast enough. Or how do I get them? Quite honestly, a lot of folks, they just watch those download numbers and it's almost like gamifying it, you know? All right, it didn't go up this week or it's going down and now it's – and for a period of time, I got sucked into that. I, I, I'm better now because I got good advice from lots of people about not worrying about it. But you still – I still had the biggest challenge because that was your question, I think, was, is finding your audience. And what I learned, and you guys are probably, again, ahead of the curve because you're younger and you grew up with this technology, is finding where your audience lives 
And for me, looking for middle-aged folks who were interested in hearing about the 1980s. Well, first of all, most middle-aged folks, people my age, they also love the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Most often because they had their first car, they went to high school, you know, that's why. But to find out where they live that you could reach them on social media, that was hard because a lot of middle-aged folks, you know, they're not on TikTok Mm -hmm. or Twitter. I had to figure out where they were and everybody's got that challenge. So the biggest challenge for me was first figuring out where they live and then reaching them. Now I'm, I'm lucky enough that I think most of them are on Facebook. That sort of became Mm -hmm. like, like our parents, like your parents, it became an older folks medium, even though it was a younger folks medium. So I was able to find them there and advertising on Facebook is pretty cheap. So once I figured that out, that became the avenue for me was uh, reaching them through there. But the biggest challenge continues to be, I would say, growing the audience. But as I mentioned, I I read this thing that I thought was great a while ago. And this guy said, with regard to downloads, because everybody's going to worry about them. And the tricky thing about it is it's easy to compare yourself to somebody else and say, well, they've got a thousand per episode or a hundred per episode, you know, and I've got 10, what's wrong with me? But the challenge is, is that every podcast is different and you have to analyze it within the niche you're in and maybe the niche within the niche. And so the Mm -hmm. fact that I'm an eighties podcast that probably appeals to older people, you know, it's not going to be, you know, some of these larger podcasts that have a broader appeal. So that's one thing. But I read this really encouraging thing where uh, uh, someone wrote with regard to your numbers, just imagine whatever number amount of number you get every week. If you had that amount of people come to a place you rented to hear you talk about whatever you talk about every week, would you be wowed? Now, Mm -hmm. for me, if I had five people show up at some place to say, we want to hear you talk, well, I'd be, oh my goodness, this is so flattering. And so if you think about it that way, I I was able to, you know, sort of get over that fact about worrying about the numbers so much and instead just continue to try to reach people, but ultimately realize they're going to come or you're going to find them as you go and Five or 10 people every episode, maybe as many people are interested in your content, you know, not your content. I mean, you know, just this uh, hypothetical podcast we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But that was the biggest challenge and remains the biggest challenge. I just don't worry about it as much anymore. Well, I love that. And I think that's really inspirational and just amazing that you decided to make this podcast because you noticed that there wasn't something like that out there. I mean, I would consider myself an old soul like I was not on social media for a long time until I felt like I had to, to like promote this podcast. I didn't even start listening to podcasts until my parents started listening to them. And then they were like, oh, you would like these. But I definitely feel like a lot of people in the older generations that I know, or they don't understand what podcasts are, or like wouldn't even know to look at them. And so I think that's really courageous to take on that challenge of you have to not only find the audience who's willing to listen, but like educate them on that this even exists. You're absolutely right. And it's funny that even like, you know, they recently, I think it was on Apple, they changed subscribe to follow. And Mm -hmm. I think the reason why is people of my generation and older, you associate subscribing with having to pay an amount of money, subscribing to a magazine or a cable channel. And so folks are turned off. So you're right. I had to educate people. It's free. I promise you could listen whenever you want. You don't no one's going to be spying on you if you listen to our podcast, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's now, interesting. Do both of you consider yourselves old souls? I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm an older soul than she is. <laughs> is that right? Yeah. I think it depends on the situation. So you guys are identical twins, right? We Mm -hmm. are, yeah. But as is the case, always one is born slightly earlier than the other. Which which of the two of you are older? I'm the older one. She's two minutes older. And I rub (laughs) it in her face all the time. Yeah. (laughs) Is that how the hierarchy works? So when the decisions need to be made... Where are you going to eat or something like that? I'm older. Two minutes. Remember that. Well, we sort of have the opposite problem because we're both people pleasers. So we'll be like, you can decide. No, I don't care. You can decide. No, I decided last time. You can decide. We kind of get in that war. And then I think I usually make her decide. Yeah, she usually gives in. It's pretty annoying because the other day we were just trying to figure out where to go to eat dinner. And she would just was like going on and on about well we could go to this place but if you don't want to do this then we could go here but I really don't care so you just pick and I was like oh my gosh just give an opinion (laughs) so the old being older actually allows you to force your younger sister into picking yeah exactly (laughs) well what was one of you more driven to start a podcast than the other it's kind of funny because I think it was her idea to start it but I feel like I'm kind of the one who spearheads a lot of the administration of it 
think it's pretty. I mean, she does the editing, but so I guess yeah, maybe. But I don't know. When we decided to start it, that was like the stipulation was that I didn't want to do the editing. She was like, here, we should do this podcast, but only if you edit all the episodes. No, it, that's not really how it works. I know, I'm just I kidding. also tried to edit some of them and then she got mad because she didn't like the way I was doing it. So she was like, I'm just going to edit them from now on. <laughs> I think being I a perfectionist that. comes with being the older one. You need everything well. <laughs> to be the way you want it to be. If I could find someone to do the editing, I would. Except I know they're going to edit in such a way that I'm like, you know what? Just I'll just do it myself. It's not yeah. how I imagined. Exactly. Then you're stuck having to do it yourself. Right. And it's it's quite a dilemma because you're like, well, I don't enjoy editing, but it's not going to be the way I want it unless I do it. Right. So yeah. Well, before we get into the 1980s specifically, I just had one more question about your podcast. Um, I saw on your website that it seems like you've had a lot of really cool guests and people on your show who are like big names from the 1980s. So I was wondering if you just have a favorite person or a favorite memory that just blew your mind that you got to interview or talk with on your show. You know, lots. But uh, one, one standout for me in particular is Cassandra Peterson, who plays Elvira, the mistress of the dark, if you're familiar with that mm-hmm. character. And she's not someone – she's iconic and, and certainly in one sense. I don't know that you – I'd say she's a big celebrity. but And I've always was a fan of hers because she was a person who in the 1980s, much like Paul Rubens, who was the late Paul Rubens who played Pee Wee Herman, she was someone who was only known as her character really. You know, you saw her in the black dress with the black wig and the makeup on, mostly during Halloween, you know, or when she had her show, she would uh, introduce horror movies. But she was primarily that character. And so I was excited that I was going to be able to talk to her because she had a book coming out to promote. But Mm. then I read her book, which is about her actual life. And she has had so many challenges through her life, starting at a very young age, so many challenges that she turned around and used as a source of empowering herself and then went on to have even as a teenager and then a young adult some crazy adventures where she met these amazing celebrities you know like she was at a concert where she ran into a tent to hide from security and Jimi hendrix was in there oh my god you know where she's she's at a hotel doing you know she's a dancer at a hotel in vegas and elvis calls her to her you know his room to meet her and the other dancers you know wow these really amazing things and she's just was such a uh strong person again in spite of all these you know issues that she had and a real person because you know i I think most folks would agree she's a very beautiful person but what was interesting to read uh, and hear is in spite of that she had the same self-doubts that you know i would say all of us do to some extent or another where she didn't necessarily see herself the way others did you know, and creating that character for her became a, a way of hiding a little bit, it seemed, you know, from mm-hmm. the person that she felt she really was that, you know, had all this uh, figurative and literal scars because she had a, a burn injury when she was young that burned a lot of her body. So when I got a chance, so quite honestly, reading her autobiography, I really just felt like close to her, you know, like I knew her and it was a good friend all of a sudden. It was really weird. Mm-hmm. I never expected that because I read these books that folks send us. And so when I finally got to talk to her, I was just over the moon and overwhelmed and felt, you know, so connected to her. So I don't know if folks would regard her as the biggest celebrity we've spoken to, but she was certainly the one that uh, I was most excited to talk to when I ultimately got to. Do you ever get nervous when you're interviewing people like that who you're really excited to talk to or who you see as someone iconic or that you've looked up to for a lot of your life? Do you get nervous for those or are you more excited? Uh, I'm more excited now. Years ago, I would definitely get nervous. And what would happen would, I don't know if you guys manage yourselves this way, but I would be able to keep it under wraps. Like, okay, I'm cool. I'm cool. And then it would be like one minute and I know they're going to dial into uh, the studio to talk, you know, via remote. And suddenly panic, (laughs) you know, just, okay, here they come. They're coming. But once it started, then it would go away again. And now I'm at a point where the panic doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just mostly get really excited about it. And I find that, look, this isn't something that's going to surprise you. But in the end, they're regular people just like the rest of us. And I just try to focus on focus on remembering that they just do a really cool job. You know, they're a musician I admire or TV personality. They just have a really super awesome job and I've admired them. Now I'll just talk to them like a person that I'm curious about, you know, sort of how we're talking now. And that makes it a lot less intimidating. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. I know you guys are intimidated talking to me. You're doing a great job not seeming nervous. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
No, I think that's something that I loved about doing this podcast is that, I mean, we haven't had any like major celebrities or anything, obviously, but we've had a lot of people who I do really look up to. And I always get nervous talking to them, especially because we're young people and most of our guests are older than us. And I'm like, I don't want them to think we're like stupid little kids. So it's been like really interesting to get to talk to these people and find out that they have such similar stories and insecurities as we all do in that like we had a our last guest was a doctor who was an expert in self-respect and just had all of this amazing all these amazing accomplishments and then she talked so much about being a high achieving perfectionist and how while we were talking to her like in her mind she was thinking do they think I sound stupid and I was like that's amazing Mm -hmm. that all of these people think that because I feel like it's so easy to just assume that everybody else is confident and proud of their accomplishments and like knows their worth and that you're below them when I think everyone's feeling the same or similar ways. Right. Yeah. I think for, for so long, you know, Hollywood, et cetera, had perfected being able to keep people sort of out of the spotlight or public. So you would never see the cracks or the, you know, people without makeup and all these things. So it was a little more mm-hmm. easy to idolize and not see them as normal people. But it seems a little bit more, maybe for good or worse, we've got TMZ and these kinds of things that show people <laughs> how they really are. Do you find it's getting easier? And Ashley, do you get nervous when you're talking to folks now? I used to get so nervous when we started. We started about a year ago. And whenever we were doing interviews, no matter who it was with, like even one time we interviewed our parents and I was so nervous. <laughs> that one was probably the most nerve wracking one. <laughs> I don't know why. Yeah, it was our first interview and we, I think we just weren't really sure how to conduct it. But yeah, I used to get incredibly nervous. And even before we started the podcast, I would get so nervous for job interviews or anything like that. Sure. And now I hardly ever get nervous. So I think that it kind of just came with the experience of doing it at least a couple times a month. I just started to get less nervous and I felt more comfortable with it. So yeah, I think it just came with the time, I guess. <laughs> Do you find that doing the podcast has given you confidence in other areas of your life? I think so. I feel like just after the first couple of months, we did a lot of interviews. Those ones were definitely the hardest because It was a lot of people that I felt like were just incredibly accomplished and I was super nervous to talk to them. And I feel like after that, I got a lot more comfortable just talking to people because, I mean, we're both introverts and I've always been pretty nervous or self-conscious, I guess, about um, approaching people. And like, yeah, I think after doing it for a while, I just got a lot more comfortable, not even just talking to people, but having deeper conversations and really being able to express my opinions and things like that. But I was going to ask you if you feel like doing the pod, doing your podcast has um, benefited you in other aspects of your life. It, it must. It must have. Quite, quite honestly, I hesitate to answer because I feel like the podcast is so much of my life now. It takes up so much of a percentage of my life. But, you know, uh, unlike you guys were at the, at the age you're at and the stuff you're interested in, I'm beyond auditioning for parts or interviewing for jobs. But I can imagine mm-hmm. how having done this now, it would help. Because just like we're talking about the kind of conversations you get with strangers, you know, every week, if you're talking to someone new every week, it's such great practice for just interacting with people socially. I do think actually just in social situations, it's helped because Mm -hmm. much like yourselves, and I find this is true of a lot of performers, because again, I worked in theater, you know, and I was Mm -hmm. an actor, but just by the fact that you can be on stage and be a character and do whatever, doesn't mean offstage you're comfortable in a crowd of people or at a party, you know? Mm-hmm. Most folks don't expect you could be like an introvert, extrovert, depending mm-hmm. on the situation. And I think I'm better at being an extrovert when I'm in public now than I was prior to the podcast. So yeah, in that sense, I would say it's it's definitely helped me grow and change, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's jump into the 1980s for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like I said, we didn't grow up in the 80s. So definitely, if there's yep. a direction that you want to take this, feel free. But I think I was first curious if there's any like big things or I guess big influences that the 1980s have on modern culture that people our age would be surprised to know are influenced by the 1980s. Yeah. Now you mentioned you were raised by a father who loves the 1980s. So you may Mm -hmm. know everything you can know about the 1980s. I'll tell you something that I'm, I was even surprised to think about with regard to the 1980s. And, you know, these are things aren't going to be terribly uh, earth shattering or, 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 or maybe, uh, you know, groundbreaking necessarily not going to blow any minds but the fact that the modern i would say the modern day action films so if you think about any of your action films 
Fast and Furious, any movie in which Jason Statham is hunting somebody down for revenge. It, 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 we didn't really have these types of macho characters, for better or worse. We could argue whether or not that's a good. It's good that we have them, and maybe we have too many of them. But these characters that uh, you know, again, these sort of uh, high testosterone guys, you know, shooting off guns in the 1980s, actually starting in the late 1970s. You know, we had this uh, documentary film called Pumping Iron, and that's the film in which it introduced the world to Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, because it was documenting him competing in his bodybuilding competition and uh, ultimately winning it, I'm pretty sure. But as a result of that, there was, you know, so many things flowed out of that, including the fact that folks became interested in bodybuilding suddenly in the 1980s, where everybody was sort of content to just eat Twinkies and be, you know, watch TV. Now, suddenly, a lot of gyms are opening up around the country. Uh, you've got uh, workout programs on TV and movie studios are interested in Arnold Schwarzenegger and also Lou Ferrigno, who older folks will know played the Hulk on TV in the 1970s. They were interested in these guys because they were – he had these huge physiques. They were both in this documentary I talked about. They were actually competing. But they wanted them to star in these films, and ultimately Arnold Schwarzenegger starts starring in these films. So as a result of folks interested in bodybuilding and Arnold Schwarzenegger now appearing in these films, the films that prior to that in the 70s and 60s, you had people shooting up people and seeking out revenge, that sort of thing. But they were regular guys. They looked like me. They had, uh, you know, they weren't in shape necessarily. And so throughout the 1980s, again, we could argue whether it's a good or a bad idea. We had these stereotype of these over, you know, exaggerated muscles, you know, Sylvester Stallone, Arnold Schwarzenegger, starring in these films that I think there's a direct line from these guys in these films and how these films are catered to these, the look of these guys and the attitudes of these guys to today. So you've got your Vin Diesel, for example, because you had your Arnold Schwarzenegger. Again, this is not necessarily earth shattering, but it was surprising to me, even someone who grew up there, that that trope, that that, you know, style, that genre of a film and character in particular started in, in the 1980s. Huh, that is really interesting because I feel like among people our age, kind of the gym bro or bodybuilding attitude among boys and men is kind of a big deal. And I think that a lot of it is based on action movie stars. So I didn't know that. I also think it's really fascinating, like you talking about that gym started opening up in fitness programs on TV based off of the interest that arose from people watching these films. I think it's so fascinating how media has such a big impact on the way that people want to live their lives. I feel like from what I've heard my parents talk about, it seems like maybe not necessarily more than today, but I think today there's so much different types of content that people can watch. And I feel like the 80s was kind of this quintessential time where everybody was watching and listening to the same things. And it seems like the media had such an impact on the culture and the way that people dressed and people, what people ate and what people did for fun and just all the things. And I'm curious if you feel like that maybe more than any other decade had such an influence on people's lifestyles or what your perspective would be on that. Yeah, I, I agree. That's a great observation. And I agree entirely with your parents about that. And I think that's one of the reasons that the 1980s was not only so special as it was, but maybe, and this sounds hyperbolic, but the last special decade in this regard, the mm -hmm. fact that you did, you're right, you had fewer choices. I mean, can you guys imagine there was only three channels really? Three channels? I mean, yeah, I, if crazy. I said two, there was only 20 channels, you'd think, well, that's so little. Are you kidding me? No, there wasn't 20. There was three. Now, there was a little more than three, there, you know, but but those were the three main networks. And then there were other local networks that showed, you know, reruns or old movies or that sort of thing. But there were three major networks that were, you know, creating new TV shows. That's basically it, right? So as a result, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. People were watching the same things. You know, this, I don't know if you've heard the expression must see TV, but that was a, a marketing platform that NBC created when they finally had a collection of shows on Thursday nights. I think, I don't think it started on Thursdays. I think it might've been Fridays or Wednesdays, but they moved it. But Thursday nights where they had this block of television that most of the country was watching. So the next day at work, folks were talking about all the same shows. You're mm -hmm. right. Today, now there's so many options, you know, it could be, I'm watching Monarch. What are you watching? I don't even know what that is. Mm -hmm. But as a result, yeah, I feel like 
you know, in, in one way, we were closer as a society, just bonded by this common interest in, in certain pop culture. There were fewer films because there were fewer film studios. So there again, we were seeing the same movies, more or less. The movie theaters were packed. I, don't, I love telling the story in one regard because it was a magical time. It felt like a romantic time to be standing in a movie theater line where you had to get there two hours early. Otherwise, you might not get a seat. Or if you got a seat, you were sitting in the front row where you had to watch at an extreme angle and your neck hurt by the time the film was over. And so, yes, clothing, catchphrases, music, all these things, there were there was fewer and we were a concentration. And so we had these common shared experiences that, again, I think bonded us. But what happened was there was a lot of deregulation in the 1980s, including the fact that there was this a law change, a federal law that allowed for cable companies, essentially. So there was greater control over cable companies. And then uh, when President Reagan came in and his administration, they said, you know, let's loosen up all these laws. And one of them allowed us to have the cable channels that we have today. But for the 1980s and this regulation, you know, it, it probably would happen eventually. But that started then. So folks started getting cable where suddenly, yeah, you have 100 channels. I had three like two weeks ago. You have the result of, and I would argue this is not a good thing. You had a result, you had the birth of, you know, 24 hour stations, CNN, where news was 24 hours. You had MTV, where music videos, I liked MTV, music videos, 24 hours. You had ESPN, which began in 1979, but didn't have 24 hour sports until the night, till 1980. Suddenly you had a lot more channels. And, you know, some of it, again, was repetitive things you would see over and over again on certain channels, which really into the 90s, it ex exploded. You know, so it began in the 80s, it exploded in the 90s. And, and you know what it is today. We have a lot more choices. But your parents are right. As a result, starting after the 1980s, there's not that concentration where you can see influences. You guys would have to tell me. But, uh, you know, the 80s for me, again, was my formative years. I guess for you, you guys, it was what, the 2010s, maybe something like yeah, that. Yeah. If you could really say, is there a look? Is there an iconic 2010s look that you could point to or sound or, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I think there were definitely some things that were big in mainstream culture, but I don't think there was a specific look think, or show or I feel like it changed every six weeks, like what the new trend was <laughs> yeah. and it was like silly vans and then rainbow loom and then <laughs> I don't know. What yeah. I don't even know them. what some of those things are. <laughs> Yeah, those were all like different kinds of jewelry things that you would make or silly bands were like okay. rubber bands that were shaped like animals and oh, yeah. kids would wear them on their arms. Yeah, they got banned at our school. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I remember that controversy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But even then, like when we were in elementary school, there wasn't streaming services. So at least mm -hmm. some of those things would come from like all the kids were watching Disney Channel or Nickelodeon. So most kids were watching, you know, Hannah Montana or iCarly. And they were watching the same commercials with the silly vans and things like that. Right. Whereas it, for kids now, there's Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and... Right. I think that it's such a different experience that it'll be interesting to see if there really is even the same kinds of cultural phenomenons that happened when we were little or if there's not mm -hmm. going to be very much of that because entertainment is so different. Yeah, I feel like right now it's so fleeting because everything that our younger cousins and the kids that we teach at our theater company, it's all like TikTok trends and they last a day or a week and then it's on to the next trend and I don't know that many things about the 1980s but I know like people wore Daisy Dukes and people like wanted to drive whatever the famous kind of car was I don't know what it was and now people wear whatever the influencer that they're all following wears and it's whatever this rich elephant makeup or I don't even that's not what it's called but there's some <laughs> makeup trend right now and then next week it's probably going to be like Sephora makeup when this generation is grown, I don't think they're going to have anything that they can like bond over because they didn't have these iconic things that withstood the test of social media, I guess. Look, I'm disappointed that that's the case, but I'm glad at least you confirmed what I feel is to be true because for me, it only reinforces the fact or how I feel about the 1980s, how special it was. You mentioned silly bands and the everybody's seeing the same commercials. That's something also that came out of the 1980s because as of the 1970s, you couldn't advertise to children during children's programming. You couldn't mm -hmm. have commercials selling toys. And then, in the, again, part of the Ronald Reagan administration, the FCC changed it 
where they said you could do whatever you want, basically, TV stations. And so they started creating TV shows that were selling products to kids. Mm -hmm. And the biggest example folks always point to is He-Man. If you're familiar with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, there's a show on Netflix now where they brought the cartoon back. But they started making the cartoon based on the fact that they knew they were going to sell those toys. And then the commercials you'd see during the cartoon were commercials selling the toys. I would say that's probably one of the things that's uh, not too great coming out of the 1980s, but that's uh, stayed with us today. As you pointed out, kids seeing the same commercials, which obviously they figured out that kids were the ones that were driving what would be bought at home because they'd bother their parents <laughs> until they got it. That's what the studies showed. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of sad, it seems, the trajectory of where we're going with our media. And uh, I, I wish, I would hope that at least, and look, you, you, I'm sure you guys are fond of the era in which you grow up. And maybe, you're, like you mentioned, your younger family members will be too. But yeah, they maybe they have less things to point to as something to anchor those feelings. Like I could, there's a vibe, there's colors, there's a style, there's fashion, there's cars, like you said, that I can picture that put me in that place and time where it seems, again, as we go on, maybe folks won't be able to do that anymore. I mean, I think there will probably always be something like even for kids who are who would call the 2020s their formative decade, even if it's not maybe a specific product or style, it'll be TikTok or something like that. COVID masks. Yeah, COVID masks. Oh, yeah, right. So I'm sure that it just kind of evolves what it is that makes the decade special. But I think that at the same time, it is kind of sad for TikTok to be the thing that bonds your generation as opposed to other things. Yeah. Well, I did want to, you mentioned twins and the fascination with twins in the 1980s. And I would love to hear real quick what your perspective on that is. I looked it up last night because I was just curious if there were shows or anything about twins. And I couldn't find a lot, but I know The Shining came out in 1980, which um, we love The Shining twins. So, well, I wouldn't say we love them. 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 (laughs) They were kind of creepy. (laughs) We love to dress up like them and like do the thing. Um, You've done that. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, when we were younger, we would do it for Halloween, and then we would go to people's <laughs> doors and say, come play with us. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's hilarious. I would love to have seen that. It would have terrified me, but I would love to have seen that. <laughs> yeah, it that was, was fun. What do you remember or think about what culture and media, kind of how it portrayed twins in that time? Yeah, and it's, you know, I was looking into it, too, because a lot of what I was thinking about was just anecdotal from what I remember. But, again, as much as I like to say that so many things came out of the 1980s, the fascinating with twins, I'm sure you know this. It didn't happen in the 1980s. You're, I'm sure you're aware of films as old as The Parent Trap, for example, which is mm-hmm. an older film. But um, in the 1980s, we did have our share of twins in movies and TV shows. But you're right. Uh, the earliest one being the, the, the twins, which actually they weren't twins. They were a few years apart. Those two, the two young ladies who played the twins in The Shining, they actually weren't twins. Mm-hmm. But um, they were playing twins. We had uh, the Double Mint commercials, which featured twins, which were you know commercials advertising gum, which had twins. And uh, two of the the Double Mint twins, as they were referred to, uh, the Seagal sisters were Jean and Liz. I think their names were. They went on to have a, a TV show called Double Trouble, you know, where mm. they played versions of themselves. We had uh, Big Business, which was a movie which had two sets of twins. That were separated at birth, so they weren't aware of their, you know, their twin. Another film is Dead Ringers, which was later in the decade, which they just brought back a version of it, Dead Ringers, which was about twins. And I guess what's curious to me is there's some things that are tropey about how twins are portrayed that I wanted to ask you guys about, and some of them are represented in these films. We can knock this one out real easy, I think. In the film Dead Ringers, the two twins are evil. So sometimes twins are conniving and just evil and up to no good. Can you confirm or deny whether or not uh, twins are necessarily just they're evil? Oh, definitely. Always up to no good. Yeah, all twins are evil. Controversy. Oh, wow. I was surprised there. Uh, Along those lines, I guess the one thing that's consistent about, and and actually, I guess a variation of that, like in the film Big Business, is there's usually one that's more devious and one that's Mm. more nice. Are one of you more devious than the other? Um I think we've gone through phases. I think when we were kids, (laughs) I was the devious one for, I think until we were seven, she was the devious one. And then I took that over for a long time. But I think- Until now. Yeah, I think now (laughs) we're both pretty like stable people. Balanced, okay. 
Yeah. I guess we'll see in a few years. Yeah. If one of us is in jail and the other ones. Has to bail them out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think I think the most thing that you probably guys, you know, are familiar with, maybe for your own lives, which is I'm curious about, but certainly how it's portrayed in media, including with, you know, this is a show I told you about Double Trouble, mm-hmm. is the idea that there is some sort of twin instinct, you know, where twins instinct, where you folks, where you can anticipate one another, or you feel things that the other one's feeling without necessarily having to talk about it, not even being in the same room necessarily. Have you guys experienced that? I think it's portrayed in a lot of films and TV shows as a lot more whimsical than it actually is. Like we don't have, we can't read each other's minds Mm -hmm. or feel each other's pain (laughs) or anything, but there's definitely just weird random coincidences where we have the same dream about something or we, I mean, we can have conversations and not use any actual proper nouns. We'll just be like, you know that thing when that time, oh yeah, I know what you're talking about. I think we definitely just have a kind of strange connection that we can I don't know how would you describe it like we'll often say the same thing at the same time or we'll text each other the same thing within a minute of each other or what were we doing the other day we were playing some game and you had to answer these questions and we both wrote the exact same sentence oh, yeah. like, with all the same words so there's things like that where we will do a lot of similar things, but it's not intentional in a way where it's like we can telepathically communicate or Mm -hmm. anything like that. But I also, some of those things, I don't know if, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's partially because we are identical twins and have the same DNA. But I think it's also a little bit that we've had so many of the same experiences that we just kind of think the same way about things and we know what the other one's talking about because we've been there for all most of the things that we'll be talking about. So yeah, I would say kind of we have sort of a twin tuition, but it's not like we can just harness it and be like, okay, we're playing euchre with our grandpa. So we're going (laughs) to telepathically communicate about what what cards you have. I wish that'd be fun. Yeah, because he beats us every single time we play Mm. with him. Then they'd make you wear some kind of special tinfoil hat to keep the signals from getting out or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys get excited when you see twins in, in film or or, or, you know, TV shows that they're represented? Yes, but only when it's actual twins playing twins. We Uh, have an issue with one person playing twins because... Not a real issue, but it's a a little bit irritating. Yeah. Especially since we are actors. If it's a character who's similar to our age, we'll be like, why didn't we get an audition for that? Right. Oh, gosh. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. A single actor is taking two roles from legitimate twins. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. exactly. We actually have a question that we usually like to ask our guests at the end about twins since our podcast is all about being twins if you could have an identical twin do you think that you would want one Hmm. well you know thinking about our earlier conversation is he interested in the same things i am because i i always just like yourselves i am envious of folks i've known not necessarily twins but in your obviously in your situation you are but brothers or sisters or a brother and sister who have the same passion for something and then team up and, and then make something great you know where they're able to have that bond that allows them to, you know, one edits and one doesn't edit, you know, that sort of thing where I've always been. Uh, so in that sense, yes, I would absolutely love a twin provided he was interested in the same things that I'm interested. In. If not, what am I going to do with him? I have no use for him. <laughs> exactly. yeah. I mean, it'd be nice to have a brother, I guess. I don't have a brother. It'd be nice to have a brother. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think it would be great to have somebody who shared the same interests and, you know, and dreams. I think that would be magical and special and just make it uh, easier maybe to attain them. That's definitely how we feel. We do all of our big, crazy ideas to Together and I don't think we could do most of the things that we have been able to do without each other. So we recommend it. <laughs> if this cloning, if cloning becomes a possibility, I'm interested. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to share with our listeners before we wrap up? Uh, only if I guess if they're interested in the 1980s, they can certainly check out my show 1980s. Now it's exactly as it sounds. We talk about 1980s every week. But you know what? What's interesting is, and just like we talked today is, I try not to just harp on how nostalgic or magical it was. We try mm-hmm. to get something, you know, extrapolate something more interesting out of it. And more importantly, how it still affects us today. You know, not just mm-hmm. emotionally, but like we talked about, the media, et cetera. Yeah, we'll definitely add your links to our show notes. Um, I think a lot of our listeners would definitely be interested. Thank you so much for doing this. This was really amazing to get to talk to you. And I'm super excited for everyone to get to to hear about everything 1980s and hear about your story. Uh, thank you both. It's been an absolute delight uh, speaking with you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night, guys. Bye. Bye.